Well, hello and welcome back to the Developer's Guide to Windows 10 Insider Preview. I'm Andy Wigley. I'm here with Jerry. Yes. And uh, we just did a session on the application lifecycle and a real complimentary tale to that is background execution. That's right. Yeah. So we're going to talk about how you can get apps to, uh, to be able to do stuff in the background. So when the user isn't actively interacting with them, how you can um, execute some code and Delight your users. That's right. And we're not talking about executing code that's done anything wrong. We're talking about executing code when your foreground application <laughs> may not be running. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about background tasks. This is where it all kind of comes together. Why would you even have a background task? Well, there's things that you want to provide to your user to give them a really wonderful and a delightful experience. You might want to update your task, or you might want to up interact with sensors and do things that your foreground application simply cannot do because it's not running. So I can provide real-time information while I'm suspended or while I'm terminated, all with background execution. Yeah, and there's um, come some of the other things we're going to be talking about in, in this whole uh, MVA is about things like um, uh, app services and uh, app to app communication. The background tasks are an, an element of all of these kind of things. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, background tasks allow your app to run when it's not running. So, that's a little anti tautology for you right there. <laughs> Building a background task is um, there are things to remember as you build out background tasks. So, a background task is simply a class and it exists inside a, a Windows component, right? It's as simple as that. So it's a separate project in your solution, yeah. And one of the things that I can do when I build the background task is I can ask what the cost is. So this is interesting to me because when I ask what the cost, this is basically saying um, how many other background tasks and activities are going on in my op in, inside Windows right now. Yeah, so you're asking the system, how busy are you? Can can you know, can we can you handle another one here? Yeah, and so when I ask for that cost, if it comes back as high, I really shouldn't work because I'm not going to have the experience that even my background task wants to have. And so I can wait until my next trigger fires if the, if you can do that basically. And a background task can schedule another background task. So that's not a big deal to go ahead and do. Uh, the other pieces around cancellation, a background task will run, but it could also be called to be canceled. And uh, it's easy to ignore cancellation if you're a developer and not quite, quite familiar with how to manage cancellation tokens. But the reality is, if you're looping through an operation, you're doing three things. Between the second and the first, between the third and the second, you should always look to see whether or not you're canceled and not continue. So that will help you as far as being clean, cleaning up and also be having the ability to log a flag to uh, pick up where you left off. So handling cancellation is another sort of a best practice inside building a background task. And don't forget that just like suspension and many of the other asynchronous uh, uh, methods that are called out, you need a deferral in order to do other asynchronous uh, operations inside that. It's easy enough to request a deferral, yep. and then just when you're finished with it, you go ahead and complete it. It's worth just saying for those who are not familiar with this, what we mean by this is if any time you're executing asynchronous code, which is pretty frequently, yeah. you need to ask the system for, you know, say, hey, you look, I'm going to go away, do some asynchronous stuff here, but don't think I'm done. Right. You know, so a deferral allows you to signal effectively. You ask for this deferral up front, you do all your async stuff, and then when you really are done, then you can complete the deferral, which is the signal back to the caller that, yeah, I am really am done now. Right. Yeah. Another great feature of a background task is your ability to provide progress information back to the user. This is just an integer, but it's some kind of value at least. And so your background task is, is working hard. You're about finished. You can, pr you can provide back 1 to 100% if you want to, just so that the foreground task can, re can kind of reflect um, how much of the work is actually being done. This is particularly interesting in an application trigger, and we'll talk about application triggers here in just a minute. When you do a uh, query for the cost, this is what the syntax looks like. All I say is um, background worker cost get background work cost, and it returns back this enum, whether or not it's high, medium, or low. And from there, I just handle whatever it is I want to do. This is not just good for your system, so when it's high, you, d you let the system keep working because you don't want to extra task it, but it's also, or build on extra tasks to make it hard, harder. But you also want to make it so that your um, background task works as well. And it, it could be if the current background work cost is high, would that, could that potentially stop your background task from be activating? That's right. If, if the overall system gets taxed too high with different tasks, <laughs> <laughs> tax and task, that's tricky, then um, 
Uh, yeah, you're right. A cancel could be called by the system. So um, where it is possible for me to cancel a background application or a background task while it's executing from my foreground task, the more likely scenario is the system will cancel it. So yay, yeah, no more. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's working a little too hard or you violated something like taking too much memory or taking too long. All right. Um, all right. So this is the way you might handle cancellation, actually. You can see here we have the uh, cancellated, can well, this is the run event of a, of a background task. In fact, this is all there is to a background task. There's so, no extra methods so, or anything. So this is where your background task starts up. This is its, uh, its genesis. That's right. Yeah. Whatever trigger you choose for this background task or triggers that you choose for this background task, um, they will cause the run to be invoked. Well, as soon as it is, the, the task instance that occurs, well, that will have on it a canceled event. That's where you handle it. You're going to do something. So perhaps you uh, use, in this case, I'm creating a cancellation token that I pass into the operation that's going on, and it tries to interrupt something that's going on. In this case, what it's interrupting a socket that's, ha that's happening. But just like before, we, this is the deferral that we get, and then the operation occurs inside that deferral, and I'm using a try finally so I can complete that deferral after the operation works or fails, but then I can just allow it to go ahead and cancel. So this is um, a simple implementation of a cancellation token, um, but it's also a sophisticated implementation of a cancellation token. If you've never seen it before, it looks a little... So, so let me get this right. So the, yeah, so the background task instance obviously is passed into your run method by the system, and that includes on it uh, this cancelled event. And then you use the uh, cancellation token source as an object which you can use to, in, in, in turn, cancel another an asynchronous thing. So there we've got a socket.connectAsync dot as task, and that is taking the cancellation token, which yeah. is how you can ab abandon that socket connection That's if right. you are asked to cancel. This isn't by, unique by to a, a socket either. This is, this is just a, a convention around tasks, so threatening tasks. Yep. And so I can pass in a cancellation token, and then in that token, invoke some sort of cancel internally. Yep. And so this is, this is not something special to background tasks. Yep. This is um, just the way you handle cancellation, and we're using it in a background task. Cool. Pretty nice. All right. Um, here is the, here is uh, the uh, more an, an advanced look at uh, getting a deferral. So remember, just like Andy said, if you don't call a deferral, if you don't get the deferral first, you're basically saying the calling method will just let you go as soon as you release the method within a wait, and you don't want that. You're wanting to say, "I'm not done yet. I want to wait until I call complete." Right? Yeah, that's the kind of. A, a gotcha, if you like, for people who are new to async and await, is that when you call an awaitable method, effectively control then returns to the caller. So um, it, it might think you're done, unless you tell it specifically with a deferral like this. How many background tasks can an app have, you might be asking yourself? The answer is a lot. A number is high enough that it's never going to really be relevant to your application. If you hit the upper limit, you may actually be doing something wrong, because that's a big number. I think there's a comma in it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How many background tasks can, can be registered on an, on an operating system? The answer is the same, a lot. And so it should be something that you should never have to worry about. It, this is a big difference than the way it was in Windows 8, where there was a set number, and I think it was 11. It was, it was a very small number. Maybe that was for phone only. But it was a small number that you had to worry whether or not the application, or whether or not the, the quota was already taken before you added your background task. And that's not to say that you can run as many of these, and just you just have free reign with running all these guys. So that's the, right. You still, we're going to come on to quotas about how the system will contain what you can do in the background, because yeah. we've still got to maintain the user experience. We don't want to kill this. It's fun to talk about subsystems, though. So the background execution system, how many, how many apps can run at the same time? Turns out it's eight. Eight can run okay. at the same time. That's so that not a set it. number, and obviously you're not going to be able to measure that because your background task isn't going to know other background tasks are running as well. But again, the re one of the reasons that is true is because your background tasks will be given 10% CPU utilization as a minimum. So that's really great for your background task, but it also means that creates an upper limit, obviously. And so eight means there's 20% uh, CPU cycles left over for burst operations and things like that as well. Those are, anyway, that's an interesting little factoids yeah, little, kind of run little, through. Little side sidebar. Yeah. Yep. Don't quote me on eight, but it is eight. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry said. Uh, all right. Uh, this is the way I would ask permission for my background task to be um, to be registered. So this is as I go through 
and say, okay, I've written my background task. It asks for, for whether or not the cost is high. I handle deferral all just fine. Now I'm ready to register it with the system. Well, this is the beginning of registering it with the system. I asked the background ac execution manager to request access, and it's a request access async. Now, there's no UI. This is different. This is a change from Windows 8. Windows 8, they, they would be prompted to give permission. That's no longer true. Another change, by the way, is there were two types of background tasks in Windows 8, one that went on the lock screen and one that went uh, not on the lock screen. And that doesn't exist either. All background tasks are basically the same. In fact, nothing is on the lock screen anymore. Now, you can still interact with the lock screen, but that's not the, the role of a background task like this anymore. Anyway, so I, re I request it. The user doesn't get a UI. This is really requesting the operating system to register it. And I get back an allowed, but I could also get back a denied, right? And so there's two types of allowed. Allowed may use a real-time activity. Allow may use always or with always on real-time activity. That has to do with the um, connected standby state. But it, the, both of those together really a wrap up that your background task is allowed to You're be registered okay. in the operating yeah. system. There is a denied. That could be for a couple of reasons. Um, and uh, it, Primarily because the user can prevent background tasks from running either on an app level or, or even on a system level. Well, you're right, but uh, to be clear, they can prevent them, but they can't stop them from being registered. And so you wouldn't get it denied necessarily for that. You might get it denied because there's something wrong with your application. You might get it denied because of the state of the operating system. You'll, you'll likely not get it denied. Oh, okay, so this is, yeah, this is about requesting access. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, and so, in, and then you could also be, it could also be unspecified if there's an error or something along those lines. Um, you would also potentially be um, denied if it's already registered. So you may have a, the same background task, the same trigger and condition combination, and you try and register it with the system twice, and you'll get, you won't be allowed to do that. And that's what you would want, because the developer may make a mistake, register a background task two times, and you don't want them to do that. All right, so this is building out the task. So now I've gotten, I've gotten permission to register it, but I haven't registered it yet. So what am I going to register? Well, I'm going to register my background task. Right, so first we start with the background task builder and put in all the pieces we need. In fact, before we register it, let's talk about first we have a name, that's the unique name, and this will be important for things like event viewer if there are errors. And then we have this idea of cancel if condition is lost. So I would only run a, 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 a background task if it has a certain condition, and we'll talk about those in just a second. But if that condition is lost, do I want to cancel it? Do I want that cancel token to be invoked? Um, and I get to decide right here. And then finally, um, the entry point. So this is just the name, the full string of the uh, namespacing class of my background task. So if in this case, it's my background task is what I called it. And I can say dot to string and it'll pull out the, the full name, including the entire namespace so I don't get a typo. All of this, by the way, is different than Windows 8 because I can use things like name of, which didn't exist in C Sharp 5. So I can. Uh, I can use with name of, I don't have to have literal strings. I can rename my task if I need to, and I don't worry that those literal strings are no longer um, outdated. So then the next thing I go to after I've created the basic of it with that background task builder, I can set the trigger. So this is the trigger that causes it. In this sample, you can see the trigger is a system trigger called time zone change. Every time the user changes their time zone, then the background trigger will run. Well, that's an interesting use case that I can't quite wrap my head around. But anyway, that's what that is. There's several of them. We'll <laughs> talk through those. Then I have this false at the end. And the false is whether or not it's a one-time trigger. So the user changes their time zone, and it never fires again. But it does fire for that first time. Or I could say it's not a one-time trigger, so it, and it, which is what false means. And in this case, every time they change the time zone, this trigger will fire. So it's kind of up to me as the, as the developer to choose how these background tasks fire. But then I also have this idea of condition. So one, the time zone chain, the time zone changed, but then I also have a condition, and I'm adding a condition to a collection of conditions, so I can have more than one. In this case, uh, the condition is a system condition called user present. This basically means that the user is logged in and has a session right now inside Windows, and they're not logged out. So some, you might have a trigger, for example, on time. Time trigger could fire, but the condition of the user present is false because they're off to lunch. Right? And so you can combine these together, and then you can see how back up here, condition launch, uh, con uh, cancel on condition lost means, like for example, the user suddenly logs out while your background task is running, so you go ahead and cancel your background task. So that's kind of up to you and the logic of your application. Pretty flexible. And then the register is all that's all there is to it. That's 
Now suddenly you've gotten permission, then you've built it, then you register it. It's just worth mentioning because um, we've got another session coming up on app services. So there are a few background tasks where you don't explicitly register them like that. So that, that's the majority case mm -hmm. where a foreground app is registering a background task. But uh, app services is slightly different where you still have a background task, but the registration is just in the manifest. But we'll cover that in, uh, in that session. Because you don't have a trigger, right? They're, 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 they're invoked by a broker. Exactly, yeah. All right, so uh, the execution of a background task equals... Trigger plus conditions. So there are two things to recognize, so both the trigger and the conditions. Right now, let's just talk about the triggers themselves. Inside Windows 8.1, we had many triggers for us to be able to use. The system trigger, the time trigger, maintenance, all the things that made applications work in a great way. But then, with Phone 8.1, we introduced a few more. We introduced the location trigger, which is a a trigger that uses geofencing and uh, several other triggers. Well, that geofencing one, by the way, is really a yeah. lot of fun. You can tell Cortana to, I want to buy a hammer next time I'm at the hardware store. And she yeah. does, it's amazing. Yeah. Of course, she's using this as well. And I say she, but we all know it's actually software. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> oh. that, that image you have, Barry, is not really her. <laughs> That's a computer generated graphic from a video game. All right. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in Windows 10, we introduce several more. We could almost double the manifest of how many we have. And so, so many here, and uh, many of them that, that are super useful, very specific in niche situations, being able to use, yeah. say, sensors and things like that. But another great one is the application trigger that we mentioned a little bit earlier. That's the ability, and this is new, the ability to invoke a background task from a foreground task. That doesn't mean it, it's inside my memory space or anything like that. I'm just causing it to start to execute. And this is a special trigger because it's also a long, a long, a long, a long life trigger. I don't, is that the right word? I can't remember the word. Long anyway, life. one of those triggers, or one of those uh, background tasks that doesn't have a 25 second limit, but it has a long lifetime, as long as it can go, basically. A long running task. Long running task, thank you. Sometimes, sometimes your handle of the English language, Andy, yeah. is it, amazingness. <laughs> the time. All right. Uh, move on. There is a time trigger, and this is easily the most popular trigger. And it's worth saying that it has a 15-minute floor, so that means it can only run every 15 minutes. If you set it to 14 minutes, it will actually run once. Then it'll turn itself off. That's basically saying that it is a one-time trigger by setting it very small. So you need to invoke a trigger and you want it to happen in four minutes. You can still do that, but you can't set up a four-minute recurring trigger. You can set up a 15-minute recurring trigger. The maintenance trigger is another one. It's pretty interesting. It requires uh, AC power to be plugged in. It used to require a uh, Wi-Fi connection. That's been yep. changed, so that requirement's no longer true. So this is this kind of long-running uh, maintenance operation. That's what clues in the name, mm -hmm. folks. Maintenance triggers. Updating your database yeah. on the back end, maybe. Yeah. And stuff the like idea that. is that yeah, it's plugged in. User may not be using it very much, so it's you know you're not going to run the battery down because you're plugged in. Mm -hmm. So you can just let this thing run away and, and do what it has to do and take a long time over. You've it. got new images, new assets for your game. You want to pull those down, yeah. so you queue them up, things yep. like that. Yep. yep. Um, so this is a long running task. That's exactly right. It, but it's not guaranteed. This maintenance trigger may never run uh, because the user, um, even if they plug in their, their device, still could, your application, your background task is going to compete for resources for the operating system. It might be that the operating system is flighting an, a version of the operating system <laughs> and it's upgrading itself. Perfect. Well, you don't win. And so there's no guarantee. It could be canceled in the, min in the middle as well. Just because it's long running task doesn't mean it'll run for a long time. It could be run for a very short time. So just things that you as a developer get to take care of. Um, there, are also, there are also these um, parameters of time. And so it's weird because it's called freshness. Not, not, how many, not the time span for repeating, interval, something like that that we know. It's freshness. What's the freshness of your maintenance trigger? It's going to be uh, a time span. <laughs> All right, so adding a trigger. Adding a trigger is uh, simple enough. Remember, you can only have a single trigger. So in this case, I'm creating the time zone trigger and, uh, and adding it to the builder, right? And so it's a set trigger, just a single operation. And I have that one shot, in this case, set to false. That's because I want it to repeat. And then that's the trigger. Yeah, and there's other ones like network coming and going, and there's, there's a whole bunch of these triggers which are pretty useful for a lot of situations. Because, you're at, because your background task only has a little while to run, um, one of the things you'll want to do is test to make sure things are available. Can I even talk to the internet? Is the user there? 
all these other pieces that you might want, these are all conditions for your task to run. And being and testing for those is costly to your application or to your background task, which actually takes away from the time quota that you have. So it'd be really nice if somehow you could work these into your trigger to make it so that your trigger does not fire unless you have internet access, unless the user is present, unless, and just fill it in from there. Well, all those things are called conditions, and nicely, they can be added to your um, trigger for you. And so uh, the execution of a background task is the combination of one trigger and zero or more conditions. All right, so uh, here are many of the conditions that you can have. So, for example, I could have user present, that's whether or not the user is logged in, or user not present, because this is just a negation of it. Same thing with internet available or not available. These are especially internet available, which can be very expensive. Yep. Um, I can determine whether or not, uh, so I, I don't have to test for that, and I can go ahead and just kind of hit it, see whether or not the network is high. And then the, the last one there on the right is really nice to say, if the, if the work cost, which is what we talked about at the very beginning, yep. is high, I don't even want to test for it. Just don't just, run me. Just don't run. Yeah. So you may not want that because you'll run anyway because your background test is so critical to your application. But many applications will just throw this in. You know, No, don't run me if the background cost is too high. Just run me the next time this trigger fires. That's one of those be a good citizen kind of features that you probably should try and remember. If you're creating a background task and it's not super critical to your app, that, that should go on it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it won't be critical, critical to your app because background tasks aren't guaranteed anyway. Well. Yeah, by definition, they can't be super. Yeah, actually, that should be that should be one of those wisdom slides. Yeah, yeah. Background tasks don't put absolutely super hypercritical functionality in it because you don't know for sure if it'll ever get run. The syntax for or creating when. a uh, condition. I know we looked at it in a previous slide. This is how it kind of fleshes out. So that here I'm creating that internet available, right? So that's a regular system condition, and then I create it as a condition itself, passing it in, and and what I could have here is add condition, and then add condition, add condition, add condition, add condition, because I can combine yeah, those all that I want. Yeah. You don't want to make the mistake of adding a condition of is, is uh, internet available and is internet not available. That would not be smart. It would, it would execute properly. It would work. But it would not run. It would run. do exactly what you asked it to it do. Would, it would absolutely do yeah. it. <laughs> all right. Once triggered, a task wait for all conditions. Well, this is a really interesting uh, scenario. Um, you create an application, or you create a background task, and you create a trigger, a time trigger that runs every 15 minutes. Let's start with some, some situations. Um, you, uh, your, app, your user turns their machine off for 16 minutes, Andy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your 15 minutes is inside that window when, the, your app, when you, their device was shut down. They turn it back on, what happens to your background task? It runs. It runs immediately because the trigger, or the yeah, the trigger was actually satisfied, um, or the, and the the condition the trigger was triggered and the conditions would be satisfied. Um, what if they turn off their machine for 33 minutes? So 15 minutes passes twice, or 31 minutes would have done it too. It passes twice. They turn their machine back on. Your application now is triggered two times while off. What happens when they run it? It runs one time. So it doesn't queue up like that, so you get this cascade of multiple background tasks executing at one time. That's not the, what you would want, and that's not yeah, the way the no, system works. They miss their slot, they don't get it back. That's right. Yeah. All right, so this goes into once triggered, tasks wait for all conditions. So now, I have a condition that the user has to be logged in. Let's say internet access, that's better. The, I, I have a condition that my, app, my task will not run without a, um, a internet connection, but I run every 15 minutes. So it runs, the 15 minutes uh, are, occurs, that that's the trigger, but there's no internet connection. Well, in another minute, the internet connection does finally arrive. That's at 16 minutes. Well, my trigger fired before, that's a whole minute later. What happens? Well, it's just like when the, when the system was shut down. Now that it's turned back on, presto. Your application is now that is triggered, it waits for the condition. As soon as the condition happens, that means at 16 minutes, your task executes. So that's perfect. The trigger occurs, it waits for that condition. Now another scenario you might be curious about. I'm triggered at 15 minutes, ready to go. There's no internet access. 16 more minutes pass. My trigger has occurred two times. Now I have internet access. So now my condition is also satisfied. What happens to my background task? Does it run two times? That would be ridiculous. Of course it doesn't. It runs one time. So we call this latching. The latching is when the trigger occurs but the condition doesn't. So the trigger occurs and it waits. Here's another scenario. 
my application is a 15 minute scenario uh, trigger with internet access as a condition. Now, I, the 15 minutes passes, it's ready to go, that's the trigger. No internet connection. Six months pass, Andy, <laughs> and no internet connection, and all of a sudden, there's an internet connection, and, oh, and there's lost. no need for reboot or anything like that in that long, right? It's, an, it's a miracle! <laughs> And uh, what happens? You'd sit and you think, oh, sure, there's something wrong. It executes in six months and 15 minutes. That is the, that's what happens. Wow. That latch will latch for as long as it needs to. It does mean you might need to test to make sure you still need to run your background task. But um, odds are you do. You've probably made a very simple task. Yeah. But that's how it works. So triggers occur. They wait for the condition. That period is called latching. They'll wait as long as they need to. And if that trigger occurs multiple times, your task does not execute multiple times because that would be silly. All right. Well, there's a whole bunch of weird scenarios for you. <laughs> yeah. Took me a long time to get all those worked out myself, to be honest. Yeah. So uh, I, I got it. All right. I'm just now, I'm just wondering about a computer that's been offline for six months. That's great. Well, it's like, oh, what is this a, button? Oh, it's on a boat. Window. Maybe it's on a boat. Okay. Yeah. No, no, it's good. It's a good scenario. Lost, Let's move on. Lost at sea, <laughs> running Windows 10. <laughs> oh, your location triggers are firing like crazy. Yeah. Well, no, there's probably no. Well, I guess maybe, I don't know. All right, let's talk about constraints. Things that you can't do is not what this is about. These are things that your task is going to be limited to. So it used to be in Windows 8, CPU time was the quota. So you only had two seconds or maybe one CPU second. Very difficult for developers Problem to get that their head nobody, wrapped around. Nobody understood it. Yeah, I don't even know for sure I understood it, to be uh, honest, Andy. I'd hate to admit things like that. I only <laughs> taught it to thousands of developers to, right. to say something like yeah. that. But the nice thing is that's been taken away because um, <laughs> it was kind of crazy. Um, but we do have time, and we'll talk about that in a second. Another nice thing, this is an anti-constraint, I suppose, is that you're guaranteed 10% of the CPU that's available to you. That's great, right? So that means even if it's taxed, it's never going to be taxed beyond that 90%. So you have a window for your, ta your task to work inside of as a guaranteed minimum. That's great. Of course, that translates to only a, n a certain number of background tasks can execute at one time. Um, all right, so what is the quota? It's not CPU time, it's wall clock quota. So I have 25 seconds to execute my background task until I get a, a um, until I get the canceled event that tells me I have five seconds left. Nice, so that is, that is 25 plus five, it's 30 seconds. It's better for a developer to think about it as 25 seconds with a five second cool down period. That's what that is. Every background task gets that, except for the long running tasks that are special. They don't get that. They don't, they don't even have a canceled event, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, they just go until they're terminated. But uh, all the normal ones have this 25-second uh, wall clock. Well, there is a memory quota and there is a network quota. Um, these are variable by device, so it's difficult to say what they are for sure. But the memory quota is the one we're talking about. A memory quota is um, 16 megabytes on the smallest, lowest end phone. So that's the bare bottom, right? That's it. And as you go into a desktop application, you're writing a line of business application that runs on a desktop, obviously you're going to have far more than 16 megabytes because they have several gigabytes of RAM that you can use, and so it's a different experience for you. But if you're writing an application and you're wanting to make sure it runs on everything, you start with 16 megabytes. Of course, you can query to see how much quota you actually have so that you can do different types of application or different types of operations inside your background task if you need to. It's just up to you as the developer to ask. Every time a trigger fires, the quota starts over. This is also new. Not true in Windows 8. No. You had to share across all your different, inside this weird time frame, and you never knew when it was really going to work correctly. Weird CPU clock thing, and yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, so now that those quotas we just looked at all reset for every single trigger. I have a 15-minute time trigger. It happens every 15 minutes. Every single time it fires, all that quota restarts, and I go again, which means I have 25 seconds to run, plus the five at the end. So that's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about resource management as a whole. We have quite a bit here, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk fast. Um, so I have the canceled event that runs. So this is a normal default, uh, a default task, right? These are the ones that have that 25 plus five. And then we have long-running tasks like uh, application triggers and maintenance triggers where they go and go and go, but they don't have a warning at the end. And so this is worth pointing out that this is not um, the way it will be soon, right? This is the way it is now. We're going to have some sort of canceled or revoked event as well to give a little notice. But what that means for you as a developer is that at the beginning of your run for a long-running task, you flag it as failed. 
And then when you've successfully executed your long run, you flag it as success. That way, if you are terminated in the middle of your operation, the flag has failed is already there, right? So this sort of works like transactions in a relational database. That's how they work as well. So nice enough. Uh, background tasks can be canceled at any time. Even though we see that 25 seconds plus five, the reality is you could be five seconds in and canceled as well. So just know that that's a possibility and it's gonna be based on resource constraints. Another thing you can do with your background task, which is uh, sort of new, um, is the ability to run it inside the same app container as your foreground task, which is really great if you're wanting to have um, communication between your background task and foreground task, like with maybe a static method or a static property or some sort of static something. Or uh, you want to interact with, say, uh, a database and hold that connection open, then you can hold it open inside a single process this way, both your foreground and app ground, app background task can interact with it. Well, this is the way it is by default, right? You're not actually hosted in the same process. You're in two different app containers. Um, one for app, your app exe and your background task host exe. This is the way everything is by default. And probably for 99, maybe, percent of scenarios, this is actually how they're going to keep it. Sure. So this DOS is responsible for running the background task. It's got a separate process that's dedicated to that job. That's right. Your memory caps are also unique. So each app, e each app container then has its own memory cap that it has to negotiate. However, we have this scenario come up. Now they're inside the same app exe app container. Hmm. Now that means your background task is inside your core application or inside your foreground application. But with that, the good news for that is you can interact with them really easily. Uh, the bad news, of course, for that is if your foreground application, let's see, if your background application starts before your foreground application, it will still launch it inside AppEXE. And your foreground application then runs and just joins it. If your foreground application launches first, obviously it runs inside AppEXE. And your background task that runs then just joins it, right? So that's how it works. If your background task ends, your foreground task is not suddenly terminated. But if your foreground task ends, your background task is suddenly terminated. So oh. that's a little bit of a caveat whenever you're using in proc. Definitely, definitely crazy. <laughs> the other issue kind of is case, around it, yeah, edge case for that one. Yeah. yeah, the other issue is around memory, and so we'll talk about that. All right, so this is the way a background task um, operates with its memory constraints, right? My, it's triggered, it runs, and then that little pink section is the five seconds to tear down, right? You can see it doesn't use too much memory. <clears throat> That's because we've done a great job writing this task. Then my application runs. Well, this is where they run not in the same process, but they're running side by side. And so my task has its same memory usage, but my foreground app, which of course has UI and all these other things, it takes a little bit more memory, but it's okay. Then I decide I'm gonna run them in process together. This is the way that it looks. Now I have my foreground app running, and I also have my task running. But because they're running inside the same process, it's that process that has a memory constraint, which is a bummer because when you look at where the memory limit is, because I put them in the same process, I've now gone over the memory limit, and now my application will be torn down by the operating system. So if you're going to use improc background tasks, think this through and make sure you're not violating your memory limit for your application. Right. Yeah, so how do you do this? How do you make it run in improc? Well, the easiest way, and the only way, <laughs> this is also way. the hardest way. <laughs> the, the, but not quite as... Let's yeah, just call it the way. The way. Is to configure in back... And the, is when you're configuring your background task in the first place, which is, this is in your manifest. You have to edit this in your manifest, yeah. Uh, you have to edit it as XML in your manifest today, but you won't have to edit it. In, edit, there will be a UI for it. Okay. Right? Yeah. And uh, so I'm sh I don't know what it's going to look like. Will it be right. a checkbox that says make this in process or not? Yeah. So uh, if you look at it without the executable line here at the bottom, if you just, oh, the equal sign is missing. Well, that's funny. It must be mm. a, a color that kind of sh faded away. Well, anyway, um, these first two, category and, and entry point, those are necessary for any background task to be registered. We add this third line of executable, and we say that it's going to be inside the same executable name, which, of course, we set up in the properties of our foreground task. Yeah. With the same executable name as our foreground task. It takes care of the rest. It understands what it is that you're trying to do. And you need to fill in the missing punctuation on this You slide. will need yes. an equal sign and quotation Some marks. quotes, yes. <laughs> yeah. An, ex an exercise for you. There yeah, you that's right. This is, yeah. this is a quasi-code, right, just to get the idea across. <laughs> yeah. A couple of ways the user can also influence your background task to make it so it doesn't work is through quiet hours. Quiet hours was introduced in Windows, in Windows Phone, and now we have it in Windows as well. This is where we say, between these hours, I don't want things to happen. Maybe it's because I'm protecting my battery. Maybe it's because I, um, I'm going to bed, 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, a number of we've all been there. You know, you're just, just dropping off to sleep and then some device, I was going to use an expletive there, I remembered where I was for a second. <laughs> some device goes... <laughs> some MVA. Some goes bleep, bleep, bleep in the yeah. background. You hate that. So, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, obviously, I can still get phone calls, and I can still have alarms to wake me up. Thank goodness. Right? <laughs> well, we'd want that. You would want that. And uh, but uh, it does mean that your background task will not start. And in fact, when you move into quiet hours, that time frame, whatever the user sets up, it also means active background tasks are canceled as well. So it's really meant to protect, to make sure that the your app, it makes sure that the device battery lasts through the night so they can wake you up in the morning. That's also part of the, the uh, use case. The other is the battery saver. So the battery saver is a UI inside settings that allows the user to see and kind of interrogate all the background tasks that are using memory and using processor time. And, it, and they, can, you, they can manually go in then and disable your background task if it happens to not be a good citizen, right? So that's just the way it is. You can't stop them from doing it either. And remember, this doesn't have to do with whether or not it's registered. You can still register. You don't see whether or not the battery saver has done this. And the user can come in and out, turn it on and off as well. They can also schedule the background saver to only come on at certain times, like when they only have 20% of their battery. And as soon as that occurs, all background tasks can be terminated or canceled and then not allowed to start again. Another reason, like we said earlier, not to put absolutely mission critical logic inside your background tasks. You really don't know for sure that they're going to get executed or indeed when. That's right. New in Windows 10 is the ability to exempt background tasks from the battery saver. Yeah. So I could say the battery saver turns on at 20% to save my battery, except for Andy's app, which is terrific. Yeah. I rely on it, right? Absolutely. Or whatever. I mean, you really, could, you really would want you that. Couldn't live without it. All right. Um, just as an, an, an aside here. So with the battery saver, the background execution manager, when I'm, when I'm asking for permission, requesting that permission, still returns approved. That's because it's not asking the battery saver. It's asking the background task registration system inside, um, inside Windows. Right? All right. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the ability to de debug these background tasks because it is very tricky. Um, we saw this somewhere else. What was it we were doing yesterday? So yeah, so in, in app services, you can kind of do, set this um, debug my app, but do not launch. So you can set a breakpoint in a background task. That's right. You can run, the, the run, run it and, uh, uh, and, and then, call, then invoke the trigger in some way, like change the time zone or something. That's right. The background task will fire up and you'll hit your breakpoint. And the whole time Visual Studio is listening, and yep. as soon as it hears that background task get yep. brought in, it attaches quickly for you so you can yep. step through it. All right, that's it. Background tasks are a big deal because it allows you to really provide a lot of value from your application even when it's not running. There are lots of things you need to know to make sure they work just right. But with the changes from Windows 8 to Windows 10, it's actually a much better experience. In fact, it's a terrific experience comparatively, that's for yeah. sure. It's where you can rich. do quite a bit. Yeah, it's very rich, much cleaner, easy to understand the quotas and everything. There's a lot of exciting stuff you can do with getting stuff running in background tasks. Quite a few more triggers quite a few new uh, conditions as well. Your background tasks can also have multiple as well as resetting the, those quotas every time they run. Write a background task, have a lot of fun with it, see all the things that you can do, be a good citizen inside that operating system. And we're gonna take a quick break, come back, talk to you guys again in five or 10 minutes. See you soon.